Your Honor, I object. He's leading the witness. How many times have you seen that on TV? Well, it turns out uh, leading the witness can really create problems with people's actual memories. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a phenomenon called misleading post-event information, or sometimes it's just called the misinformation effect. If you take a witness and maybe they've seen some accident, the way you ask questions about their memory for the accident changes their memories. Mm -hmm. So we don't just remember what actually happened in the event. Our memory for the event is changed whenever people ask us questions about the event. And this is obviously a big problem for the criminal justice system because when you're an eyewitness to an event, what happens? Well, the police officers come and ask you about the event. Your family members ask you about the event. Before any trial, the lawyers ask you about the uh, event. Then again, they ask you about the event during the trial. Mm. What kind of methodology do cognitive psychologists use to study the misleading post-event information effect or the misinformation effect? Well, first they present the information that they want you to remember, say a car accident or some event. Then they present some bit of misleading information to one group of subjects, the experimental group, and not the other group of subjects, the control group. Then they measure the memory that people in both groups have of the original event. That's a standard uh, methodology. You'll hear that over and over again. Here is how the original misinformation effect worked. You see a series of photographs, and one of those photographs contains a picture of a car stopped by a stop sign. Right? Afterwards, you read descriptions of the pictures, the photographs that you just saw. And in one of those descriptions, it is said that the car stopped by a yield sign, not a stop sign, which is what you actually saw, but the description says a yield sign. Then your job is not to do anything with any more questions or text, but to look at a new set of pictures, half of them you've seen before and half of them you haven't. The key is one of those pictures depicts not what you saw originally, but depicts what you read about later. And what happens when you ask people, just pick the pictures that you saw originally? Uh, subjects in the experimental group are 20% more likely to mistakenly say, I've previously seen the picture of the car by the yield sign. Let me tell you the classic study, though. When I was a kid in high school, uh, you used to be able to get driver's education in public high schools. And a lot of times they would show you movies of terrible car accidents, I think to try to scare us all into driving safely. What Beth Loftus and John Palmer did was to show a group of subjects, a large group of subjects, uh, some of those crash movies. And one of the crash movies, there's a drawing of it here, um, they were asked questions about later. So everybody saw exactly the same thing. The only thing that differed in this study is the questions, actually one word, in the questions that were used later to ask people about their memories for the car accident. So you see a car accident, and what happens? Later, some of the subjects are asked, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? Other people are asked, how fast were the cars going when they collided with each other, bumped into each other, Another group, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? How fast were the cars going when they contacted each other? Now, if English is your second or third language, it might seem like all of those words mean the same thing, but they don't. They all imply different degrees of force. So, collided, crashed into each other. There's a lot of force behind those words. But, how fast were the cars going when they contacted each other? contact. It doesn't imply force. So, everybody sees the same thing, but the question, the wording of the question changes. Now, what did Loftus and Palmer find? They found that subjects' memory 
for the speed of the cars depended significantly on a single word in the question about how fast the cars were going. If the subjects were asked how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other, then on average the speed they gave was about 40 miles an hour. If a group of subjects who saw exactly the same event but were asked the question how fast were the cars traveling when they contacted each other, those people remembered the cars at traveling at 30 miles an hour. That's a big difference. That's a really big difference. You could say, oh, it's just 10 miles. It's a really big difference. And when you think about the court of law, where a small difference can mean the difference between uh, prison and no prison, this is huge. But you could say, well, maybe people are just, um, maybe their memories aren't actually changing. Maybe they're just, you know, demand characteristics, giving the researchers the information that they think the researchers want. Loftus and Palmer had a brilliant way of testing that idea. A week after this experiment uh, was concluded, they brought the subjects back and asked them the question, oh, by the way, you know that car accident that you saw? Was there any glass at the scene of the accident? Any broken glass? Now, there was no broken glass, but subjects who were asked how fast were the cars going when they hit each other, only 14% of those subjects said that they remembered broken glass versus subjects who had been asked how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other, a third of them remembered broken glass. That difference is significant and it implies really does change your memory. In other words, the way a police officer or a lawyer asks you, or a family member, asks you questions about an event that you saw changes your memory for that event. This obviously has huge legal implications. The process of uh, retrieving a memory to answer a question. Every time we retrieve a memory to answer a question, the wording of that question gets combined with our memory for the accident and changes our memory. So when we retrieve a memory, when we, the environment around which that memory is being retrieved changes the memory. So let's go back to the Innocence Project. Remember I started a previous lecture with pictures of people who had spent anywhere from seven years to 30 years in prison because an eyewitness had a false memory. So let's, let's do this. Here's another picture of a gentleman who served 32 years in prison. Why? Because the one eyewitness to the crime put him there, but that eyewitness was not credible. 32 years. You want to tell me cognitive psychology isn't important? You tell that man. Hmm. Okay, so the Innocence Project. Ridiculously important. We need to reform our criminal justice system so that we don't mess with people's memories. Come right back to find out why some people believe fake news.